Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Anjali Shetty. Today, I'm going to discuss one topic of CNS that is very important as a part of your studies also, and overall in your studies also, it could be very much useful. I'll be discussing in this particular session the physiology of learning, and uh, the next session, which will be in continuation with this, is the physiology of memory. As both of them are related, but I have taken into two sessions. So first session I will be recording the physiology of learning, and the next session will be on memory, the physiology of memory. So let us discuss what exactly we know regarding the learning process. All of you know that everyone is continuously learning, learning and learning, academic, non-academic, whatever is dependent on learning. And whatever learning which has been occurred, how we are able to memorize it, depending on that only, our life pattern, the academic pattern and the non-academic pattern is decided. So as a person, it is very much important to have a perfect neural mechanism to learn and to memorize. So first, we are going to see what exactly is learning. Learning actually is the neural mechanism by which a person changes his or her behavior as a result of experiences. So in a simple language, what we have is different type of experiences we gather as the life is continued. Now take the example of academic experiences or take your examples of non-academic experiences. And depending on these experiences, you change your behavior. And the change in the behavior is done by a neural mechanism. And this particular process is termed as learning. And whatever learned experience you have, that is stored inside your cortex. And these are then termed as memory. So this is the basic difference in learning and memory. So learning is an ongoing process. It continues on and on every time a different thing you learn. And depending on that experiences, you change, keep on changing the behavior. And whatever is important, whatever is learned, then that part will be stored inside your brain. And that will be termed as memory. So today we are going to discuss regarding the first process that is learning. Now learning is of two types. The first type, it is classified as associative type of learning. So there is a relation of one stimulus with another. And this is the first type of learning process. And this can be occurred by two processes. One is classic conditioning and the second is operant conditioning. The second type of learning process is non-associative. So there is no relation between the two stimulus. Either you react with it or you ignore that stimulus. And this is non-associative. And the process by which it occurs is habituation or sensitization. So on, uh, if you consider the type, there the learning can be occurred by two methods. Either you associate something with another and then you learn. Or the second method is there's no association between the two things. What you do is either you react it and then learn or you ignore it and then learn. So this is how the learning neural mechanism is occurring. If it is a associative, there are two processes, classic conditioning and operant conditioning. And if it is a non-associative type of learning, then it is occurred by two methods. So in detail, we are going to discuss this. First, we are going to see the associative learning. As we have just now discussed, that the subject will be learning about the relationship that can associate one stimulus with another stimulus. So there are two stimulus and there will be a relationship which is developed or associated or linked between these two. And due to that, whatever neural changes, whatever neural responses are there, we learn by that particular mechanism. So this is a conditioned process. So you condition that, which results in the formation of learned responses and this particular process then is termed as conditioned reflexes. So you get a response reflex 
and this will be a conditioned process and that is why they are termed as conditioned type of reflexes. Now here what happens, there are two stimulus. One stimulus is conditioned stimulus. So this is an automatic response which was not having any response when it was previously evoked. And the second stimulus is unconditioned stimulus which was associated repeatedly with the first conditioned stimulus. And due to this association, there was a reflex response which is C. And this particular process is termed as associative type of learning. In detail, we are going to see in this particular next slide. So this particular classic type of conditioning this associative learning can be occurred first by classic conditioning. And this was observed first by a Russian physiologist we named as Paolo. He noticed that his dogs, which were he kept when he was keeping as an experimental animal, they are starting the salivation just on seeing the animal house. So they are not actually feeding the dog, but just by seeing that person, they will start salivation. And this particular observation he started thinking that there must be a stimulus which is having a link and that is causing the response of salivation. <coughs> so this, sorry, so some sort of association he thought that in the brains of these animals, the visual stimuli by seeing the housekeeper is the conditioned stimulus and the food ingestion, which is an unconditioned stimulus for salivation, when food is placed. So he thought there might, that there might be the relation or linking between these two stimulus that is causing the response. And this particular thing is termed as classic conditioning. So what he developed is that he developed a Paolo's experiment in that the stimulus he gave as ringing of them. So this is unconditioned stimulus. If you are only ringing the bell, the dogs will never salivate. But what he did is that first he rings the bell, which is followed by giving the food, which is an unconditioned stimulus. So only food, if it is given, definitely salivation is occurring. Because for salivation to occur, the food is the first stimulus. So whenever any food is kept in the mouth, the salivation immediately starts. So this is an unconditioned stimulus. But what he did is before giving the food, he was giving a conditioned stimulus as a ringing of bell. So this particular process he repeated many times. And after repetition, even giving the conditioned stimulus, that is ringing of bell, the dogs were showing the response in the form of salivation. So no food was there, no unconditioned stimulus was there but still the animals were showing the response. So this is the learning process which is occurring by classic conditioning method. So this is in the brain, this occurs that you have the two stimulus, the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus and you get the response. So whenever you want the response, generally it is due to the unconditioned response. But if you are continuously repeating this cycle, conditioned uh, stimulus, unconditioned stimulus, and then getting the response, after some repetition, even if there is no unconditioned stimulus, you will get the response even after getting, uh, stimulating the conditioned stimulus. So this is termed as classic conditioning. The second type is operant conditioning. Now, this type of operant conditioning is that the person, the subject, is taught to perform some voluntary action. So, a series of voluntary action will be performed in response to a particular stimulus. Say, for example, visual or sound stimulus that alerts him to perform the learned action in order to obtain the reward or avoid the punishment. So you must have seen some circus, uh, some bandar ka in the childhood. What happens is that if you are uh, 
giving a particular sound, if we are showing something and in the, that as an alerting sign, then immediately the animal will start doing some action. And these are performance of some voluntary action in response to a alerting signal. Now, after the complete act is over, we must have seen is either reward or punishment is given. And to obtain the reward or to avoid the punishment, the animal will be performing the voluntary action. So just by seeing that particular sound, just by seeing uh, the person who is a trainer, the animal will start doing that particular action. So this is known as operant conditioning. Here, the alerting signal acts as a condition stimulus, whereas the pleasant or unpleasant event that follows the performance is representing the unconditioned stimulus. So here, by this particular figure or by this particular experiment, you can get an idea regarding the operant conditioning. Here, what happens is, this experiment is done on the rats and these are the maze which are prepared. These very commonly, these experiments, these types of experiments are done at the Institute of New Hans, Bangalore. They, they are doing very much study on the learning and the memory processes. Most commonly they do on the rats. So what they do is a rat is there and the mazes are prepared. So the mazes are having two arms. And in one of the arms, there will be the reward. So the animal will get some fruit or something or food or something. So if the animal is moving in this particular direction and if he is getting, animal is getting the reward, he keeps on doing that voluntary action. So the animal will automatically move on this particular side of the base. If on the other side, if there is a punishment, so what we have in this particular maze, on this particular side, a shock is given. So this is a punishment. So after reputation, what the animal does, he automatically avoids this particular side and he goes on the other side. And this is known as operant conditioning response. And this is how the voluntary action is learned. Now this operant conditioning, where we can use in the human being. Very common example is car driver and the traffic light. From the very far distance, if you are seeing the red traffic light, immediately the driver will stop the car. That is the, by seeing the visual stimuli, you do the voluntary action of stopping the car. And if the light is turning on green, then immediately the driver will start the car. So this is what is a common example of operant conditioning. The integration of this particular neural mechanism, they occur at the hippocampus and amygdala, and they are very important in linking the stimulus to the operation. And the most important part is orbitofrontal cortex. So these three parts of the brain should be normal, then and then only the learning process with this particular mechanism is possible. The second type of learning is non-associative learning. So what we have learned is association type of learning. Here now, the non-associative learning. So here there are no linking between the two stimulus. How the subject learns is either the stimulus is ignored or there is a reaction to the certain stimulus. And there is no need of association between the two stimuli and this occurs by way of habituation or by way of sensitization. Now what exactly is habituation? It's a very common example. You make a habit and by doing the habit, say for example, you have the habit in the morning, early in the morning, you have a habit of uh, reading something and some of you have the habit of reading at the night. So if this is where you get the habituation of that particular process, so that voluntary actions are learned like this. So this is known as habit formation or habituation. So what happens is there is a gradual decrease in the response to stimulus 
when it is frequently repeated. So say for example, habituation is that. So you ignore. If you are continuously giving that particular stimulus, you ignore that particular stimulus. If it is frequently repeated, it is very simple, widespread. And uh, say I have given the example of reading, but it is a better example. If it is uh, to react with that, but this example, which is uh, very commonly seen, suppose there is a loud and unexpected sound, which is coming from one side suddenly. So what you do is you turn to that particular sound and whenever you are turning, there is a change in the heart rate and change in the blood pressure also. But if you say that this particular sound is not significant, so even if it is repeated at that particular loudness also, there will be no or little response. So it is not showing any, uh, it is like uh, for the first time you are entering in your anatomy dissection hall. Say for example, on the first day you smell of formalin and after a few days you don't smell anything. Why? Because the particular stimulus has been habituated. So your body is not giving any response to that particular thing. Now it happens and you learn to uh, respond like this. This habituation is stimulus specific. So particular stimulus, if you feel that it is very important, then definitely, even if it is repeated many, many, many times, you are going to keep the response. So say for example, take the example of mother and baby. If a mother and baby is in the crowd and a loud traffic noise is there, but still the mother can identify the sound of her own child. And this is a, it is a stimulus specific. The mechanism by which this occurs is uh, due to the decrease in the calcium influx. Due to repetition of the stimulus, there are uh, closure of the calcium channels and there is decrease in the calcium influx, which decreases the release of neurotransmitter and due to that, the response to the stimulus is decreased. This particular process was done in the snails, which is known as aplasia, and in that, the same response was seen. So if it is first time stimulus, then very strong reaction of the snail was there because you were having the uh, calcium, you were having the neurotransmitter. But if it is repeated, then it becomes habituated and you don't get the neuro enough neurotransmitter and there is no reaction at all. So this is what is habituation process. Opposite to that, it's sensitization. Now, what is sensitization? Even if it is a minor strength of stimulus, you will get a reaction or you will get a response. And this is what is just a sensitization. So, there is a potentiation in the response to stimulus, increased response. So, either it is due to pleasant or painful when it is frequently repeated. It is again simple and widespread. And I have given the example here of a stray dog. Okay, if you are moving on the road, there are not many stray dogs. But by habituation, you don't look at this. But if some of you or one of you, by chance, in the past, if he or she has been bitten, then he will look for that particular stray dog. He will become more attentive and develop aversion, reaction to them for a long time. So this is what is sensitization. So this is how it is a stimulus specific. This is a funny example which I have given because it is a stimulus specific. That means if you are afraid of dogs, doesn't mean that those who, who are bitten by dogs will not be afraid of donkeys or cows. It is stimulus specific. So every time a different stimulus is there, the reaction of the CNS will be different for that. And the neural mechanism will be acting like that. The mechanism behind it is there is a potentiation. So any strong stimulus will be facilitating the interneuron, which increases the cyclic AMP, blocking the potassium channels, depolarization of the presynaptic neurons. That causes the calcium channels to be opened and more amount of calcium is influxed to cause increased release of neurotransmitters. 
and you get more response to mild stimuli. So this is the interneuron. This is a, a particular interneuron. And due to this, you can see that whenever it is stimulated, this causes a release of cyclic AMP. And this cyclic AMP, this closes the potassium channel. And due to the closure of the potassium channel, there will be opening of the calcium channels and the calcium ions will be entered inside. They will be acting on these synaptic uh, vesicles and they will cause the release of neurotransmitter. And so, even if there is a less stimulus, you will get a more response. And this is what is sensitization. So that is all regarding the learning process. Enjoy learning. May it be by any way, associative or non-associative, but enjoy your learning. Thank you.